A reading of the basics text, if you want what we have from the stories. After a lifetime of using, this southern gentleman learned that the most gracious thing he could do was open the doors to an NA meeting. In this story, from our first edition, he recalls that the first time a man told him he loved him was in Narcotics Anonymous. If you want what we have. My name is Bill. I'm a junkie and a juicer. For many years of my life, I felt that the world had dealt me a cruel hand, which left me with many inadequate feelings. Fear ate a hole in me that I was never able to fill with drugs and alcohol. I was born in Alabama in 1933. My father's job required constant moving, which meant new schools and new faces. I was small and sickly, and my insecurities and inadequacies around people increased. I fought these feelings verbally and with my fist. Punishment, in some fashion, followed me everywhere. My father died when I was seven, and I remember the hate that I felt because he had left an only child to fend for himself. My grandmother, aunt, and mother spoiled me rotten. Every time the church door was open, I was there. At the age of ten, everyone in the family thought a baptism was in order. I didn't feel any different than when I got up, than when I knelt down. Control was the name of the game. I tried to control everyone in our little family and outside, including the nun who caught me stealing cold drinks in a convent. Another form of punishment that I felt was a rejection. My mother married a man who later, later proved to be an addict. We moved to another city, and the war within me intensified. Continuous fighting at home created more fear and insecurities. When I was away, I hated my home and resented the people in it. Drawing upon different concepts, I began another way of living. It did not matter to me what lengths I had to go in order to gain love and approval from everyone. Up went the false front with more dishonesty and deception. I was to spend many years of my life trying to be something that I was not. Relief came at the ripe old age of 17 or 16 in the form of alcohol at a dance. Immediately, my fear of girls was gone. My two left feet disappeared, and I knew exactly when and where to lay my newfound wisdom of people. The effect left, and I was back at war with me. I believed rules were made to be broken. Society's laws were not for me. They hampered my way of living, and I began to deal with reality the only way I knew, and that was using the drug alcohol. This was the only drug I was aware of in the late 40s, and I used it to leave, ease, ease the pain. At the time, it was the best way to cope with them. Anyone could punch my buttons if I thought that it was needed for their approval of me. After a small skirmish with school officials and city authorities, private school was necessary to finish high school. Two years of college proved even further than this world, and everything in it was full of crap. I cared for no one at this stage of the game. However, I met a young lady who met all of my requirements. She was from an old family, very regal in appearance, and possessed all of the social graces. We ran off and got married. I entered into a new relationship that I was not mature enough to handle. I fancied myself in the future of, as the old southern gentleman, broad brim hat, bow, bow string tie, overlaking his vast domain with a mint julep in one hand and a gold cane in the other. Material things were the basis of, for happiness in my life at this time. I either looked up or down to people, depending on their seeming net worth. 
After attaining a lot of these things, happiness and peace of mind did not come. My salary as purchasing agent at a large hospital was not enough. Stealing to support my materialistic ambitions was necessary. The salesman, <clears throat> the salesman soon found my vulnerable spot. Women, wine, and song. They began to supply my demand. Drinking and partying every night soon made a physical wreck out of me. In the latter part of 1954, I was introduced to a little goody called codeine by a salesman to draw a clean breath. Something was cruising in me every moment of every day. I was 21 years old and a full-blown addict. Routine encounters of addicts and alcoholics treated at the hospital convinced me that I was unique. I would never become like they were. The standards and expectations I set for myself and others were too high to be met. Negative thinking and escapism became my total personality. Greediness compelled me to study things, study drugs, and experiment. This may have saved my life while I was using. I feared certain combinations in trying to get off. The 60s came along, and I decided I needed a change. I left the hospital for what I thought were greener pastures and began to travel. Life was still hell. The old nest of negativism, negativism followed me everywhere that I went. Jobs came and went, and when they came, no more. The jails and hospital stays were more frequent and longer. In 1973, I came into a mental ward. I was chained like an animal. My psychiatrist, who I constantly conned over the years, knew of my alcohol problem, but not of my other addictions. It was suggested that I try a 12-step program. My family was willing to try anything, so off I went for all the wrong reasons. People were kind and helpful to me, so I began to use them as I had others all my life. They had never seen me clean and dry, so how were they to know if I was using? I was very careful not to talk too much about anything, lest they become specific. Vicious. Deception and denial were the games that I played, and they almost killed me. At this time, I had gotten off the hard stuff <sighs> and on to downers, uppers, and mood elevators. People seemed happy and sober, and I wondered what they were using. I do not believe there was a fragment of honesty in me at the time. Willingness to change never crossed my mind. Gambling, women, and using were my bag. For over three years, I lived in hopelessness and despair, going back to using and going back to the program. After hearing the higher power concept and about a spiritual way of life, I knew drugs were not for me. I had at one time a God, graciously given to me by my environment, whom I did not understand. I knew this God and did not want anything to do with someone like me. There were times when I tried to relate, but there seemed to be something missing. I sincerely think that even though my feelings seemed to be the same as others, there seemed a lack of deeper understanding that I needed. God bless them, they tried. There were no recovering addicts in the area and no N.A., I looked for people with other drug dependencies and finally found one lady in the group. She had spent 10 years in and out without any success. Things did get a little better. There were no arrests and no stays in the hospital for a period of two years. Then, in the fall of 1975, everything went to pieces. Back to the hospital I went exchanging the alcohol for pills. I was back in the old paradox again. Then a series of events began that changed my life. 
there was talk of committing me to the state institution. My family no longer wanted me like I was. Two program members came one afternoon to see me, and they both told me the same thing, that I wasn't crazy to come back, don't use, and ask for help. My sponsor, who had fired himself several times for my case, picked me up and took me to a meeting. The girl who rode with us spoke that night. She talked about God of understanding. Sitting next to my wife that night, I began to see where I had missed the boat. <clears throat> I went back to the dark room and thanked God for those people because somehow I knew they cared. Even though they did not understand many things about me, they gave me time out of their lives and asked for nothing back. I remembered the 11th step in the program and thought maybe, just maybe, if I asked for his knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out, he might help. I got a little brave. I knew it wasn't honest. I added, P.S. Please help me get honest. It would be great to say that I left the hospital and never used again, but it didn't happen that way. It was almost like all the other confinements I had experienced. I came out of the hospital with exactly what I went in with me. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's passed. Just like a wink, a blink, and a nod, and I was still praying. Everything got worse. My family kicked me out the day after New Year's. I knew it was hopeless. But I was still asking for honesty. On or around the 5th of January, I began to ease off the pills I was using. It wasn't any fun. But I know today that all the suffering was necessary. Praying and tapering off had become my obsessions. I felt like this was my last chance. I took my last pill, shot, etc. in March. By God's grace, I was clean. People began, began to tell me, look what you have done, and I began to believe them. I got to looking so good to me that I just invited me out for a drink. What a rude awakening. I came off that drunk, cold turkey. No pills, nothing, for the first time in over 21 years. For five days I shook, and I mean shook. On the fifth day, I wanted no more. I sat down in my little VW, bowed my head and told God, if this is all in life for me, I want life no longer. Death would be far more merciful. It doesn't make any difference any longer. I felt a, a peace come into me that I had never felt. I don't know how long this lasted, and it doesn't matter. It happened, and that's the important part. Since then, I've experienced the same feeling from time to time. It was like being brought forward from darkness to light. God doesn't let me stay in the sunlight too long but he will help me if I choose to stay in the twilight. I walked away from that car a free man. I did not realize this for a long time. Since that day, I have not had a desire to use. God of my understanding had sent me enough honesty to get started down the right path. I went back to the program, and again, I made another mistake. I kept my mouth shut with the intention of letting the winners teach me how to become clean. Today, I know that for me, I walked a different path through addiction, and I had to walk a different path through this program. I had to learn about me. For almost two years in the program, I saw people come and go with addictions other than alcohol. One night in Birmingham, I was sharing with the group, and I was also talking about drugs, when a man approached me with tears in his eyes. He told me of his son and daughter, somewhere hooked on drugs. He said, surely God must have some program for people like them. 
All the way back home that night, I talked to a girl using drugs, a schoolmate of my wife. The telephone gave us the answer through some new friends from Georgia and Tennessee in Narcotics Anonymous. A visit to Cher in Chattanooga proved to be a blessing. Several people came up from Atlanta, including one guy from Marietta, who kept telling people that he loved them. I was 44 years of age at the time. That was the first time a man had ever told me that he loved me. For some explainable, unexplainable reason, I also felt his love. A couple of months later, we went to Atlanta and found a repetition of our first trip. I wanted so much to give and feel as these people did. <laughs> At the close of this dance, of the dance that night, I overheard something that went like this: "If you want what we have, you have to take this. You've got to take the steps." I came back to Alabama and began to take the steps. I learned about me and found a God of my understanding. Trust God, clean house, help others. Explains it as simply as I can. Spent many years looking for something around the corner, or someone coming down the street who would give me happiness and peace of mind. Today, through the steps and the people in NA, I have found a solution. I have to stay honest with me, stay open-minded enough to change, and be willing to accept God's love for me through the members of NA. <clears throat> I am grateful to our brothers and sisters in Georgia for their tolerance and support during our first year or so in the program in Atlanta. They more or less sponsored me in those early days. Just knowing that they were there was very comforting. Many times I called my friend in Marietta despondent over the way things were going. He always seemed to have an answer. Keep the doors open and God will do the rest. NA groups now have sprung up in several cities, and now those people are sponsoring me through their growth in NA and God's grace. I finally got it all together, but without God's help, I forget where I put it. There is one thing that I can that I feel I can give to every addict to use. I love each and every one of you, and most importantly, God loves you too. I found this love in the wonderful program of NA, through God's grace and you people. Come join us. It works.